story of them all. Jesus was a dying and hell had a ball. All those Jews were rejoicing. They thought they'd won the war. But soon they would not be laughing anymore. On that resurrection morning, when the sun woke up the earth, and the caverns of the deep, they opened up this to give birth. To a resurrected Savior with healing in his wings. And all of us standing when you get back to your seat and we will all right God bless you the Lord is good and I am so thankful for where he's brought me from the last five years in the natural arena have been great testing and trial but in the spiritual arena I've thrived and uh Living out of the realm of spirit, I've learned how to live, move, and have my being in Him. I'm thankful to stand here today in victory. Praise God. Standing in victory. All right, to the board, please. Let's go. And uh, we make our announcements. Feed the Hungry, which is this Friday, December 4th. And we do need lots of help. I can't do that by myself. I'll be here to help. 8 o'clock in the morning, Friday, till about 11. It is the holidays. We're expecting more people. And uh, we're going to have the truck here. They'll be here somewhere between 8.30 and 9. And we'll need to be set up and ready to go. And so please, if you're going to help me, if you'll see me right after church over in this section for about five minutes, I won't hold you, but I need all the help I can get, okay? We need men, we need women, we need young people to help. And uh, have to be 18 or older to help, but we want to get together and have a great time ministering to people. Amen? And uh, I promise you, I learned how to do this. I go to each car, get about two and a half to three minutes, offer prayer, preach the gospel. I can do it in three minutes. I know you don't believe it, but I've done it. I could do it. <laughs> Miss Dreamer tells me it's pit stop prayer. <laughs> pit stop, just quick pit stop at each car. I talk to every single car, and we want to bless people. So let's be part of that. And then uh, shoe boxes is next Sunday. We're doing that with the teens and the kids. And then they'll go on December 9th to help with the shoe boxes there in Charlotte. And December 20th is our Christmas dinner after the morning worship service. So we thank God for the month and the holidays and family and everything that's going on. I know we're all busy. And so I try to be mindful of that as your pastor, not to uh, take up too much of your time. I'm mindful of the stewardship of your time. Yeah, everybody in here has 168 hours a week. That's all you get. And uh, so we, you know, we ask for the Sunday and the Wednesday, and then, well, we're, what else we do is limited. We don't try to do a whole lot more, especially during the holidays, because I realize you got family, you got jobs, you got many other things to do. So be mindful of that. And if you can't help Friday, please be in the meeting right after church. All right, George and Sherry Nivens and their family, we're going to pray for them this week and bless them. And uh, they are a rich blessing to Open Door, and we love and appreciate them. It's good to have all of you. It's good to see Thornton this morning. He came in, and he's a great minister of the gospel. And Steve House is down from Maryland moving back, and we're thankful. We want you back, Steve. It's time to move in and move back. And uh, all of you that are here, welcome.
good to have Teresa's mom and dad there with us. Margaret and Jean are there, and we welcome them this morning. And uh, all of you that are here, it's so good to see you in the house of the Lord. Blessings and favor in Christ. All right, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for much favor and abundant grace flowing like a river to open your word, Lord. We have enjoyed your presence. We've enjoyed your praise. We have been touched by your heart and by your hand today. Thank you. You've already brought healing and hope and help to everyone who would receive it. So today as we open your word, I pray your word would open unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Understanding, unveiling him, revealing his glory, his truth, who he is, what he's done for us, how that relates to us and causing your people to stand in victory that we might minister victory to others. We thank you and praise you and bless you for it. Now let your word be sown on good ground. Let it be deep planted within our hearts and it will bring forth good fruit, some 30, 60, and in these who hear a hundredfold. Thank you for a hundredfold. Abundant revelation, abundant manifestation, and confirmation of your word in our hearts. In Jesus' name, and we say together, amen. All right, children, young people, you may go. And if you're in the auditorium, you can be seated. Let's open to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And we'll go further in our study today. And God bless you in the spirit and wisdom of revelation in Jesus Christ. It's good to have you in the house. And God is good. Marvelous time of praise and worship today. Marvelous time of blessing the Lord. I'm pretty sure, Thomas and Sheila, none of that was none of that was planned. Pretty much most of it was just what you decided to do. And I appreciate that about them. They're not stuck on a piece of paper. They can flow and minister and go where they need to go. And I appreciate that so much about them. You always need to be led by the Spirit, whether preaching or praising. No matter what you're doing, you need to be led by the Spirit. We're going into a rich place this morning. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. We'll read with understanding. And uh, we will just move into the word of the Lord. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. The spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you. I am can only become he is in you. Greater is he. I am becomes he is in you. The spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive, give vital energy to your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The endless supply of the stripes of Jesus are found in that phrase, quicken your mortal body. Flowing, healing, moving, ministering all the time. The Spirit of God quickening our mortal body. I live in a quickened state by whose stripes you were healed. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. If ye live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, his life, his working, his instruction, do mortify or render inoperative or powerless the deeds of the body, you shall live. So this, this anointing here is not only for healing, it's for holiness. And we are not only healed, but we are holy, spirit, soul, and body. We present our body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. This is our reasonable service. Verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Oh, I pray we be led today. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Now, if you have that spirit, it's because you received it. And if you received it, you can just rejoice. It did not come from the Father. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received. Thank you. I have received the spirit of adoption, which means God chose me. This is the spirit of God's sovereign choice. You'll find that in Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us in him that we should be holy and unblameable before him in love in the foundations of the world. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The deepest cry of God's heart is that we would know him as Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God continually, constantly affirming my sonship in Christ. 
and verse 17, and if children, then heirs. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. Thank you for the rich inheritance that you've given us in your son, Jesus. Freely given us all things, Romans 8.32. All things are yours, 1 Corinthians 3.21. You are complete in him, Colossians 2.10. You're blessed today. You're heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If so be we suffer with him, we may also be glorified or approved or affirmed together with him. And there's something going on around us. But thank God something far greater is going on in us today in the Lord. All right. Now, what I want to do this morning, because I'm going to read a few scriptures. Go to John 16, and then I'm going to read the text, and then I will preach to you after we read. John 16. Let's go there in 23 and 24. John 16, 23. And in that day... And this is the day when he gets up from the dead. You shall ask me nothing. Now notice that, that that's difficult because we ask Jesus things all the time. But he actually tells us here, you ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Notice he tells us here that we pray to the Father in his name. And up to this point, his disciples had not done so, but his name is going to change our prayer life. He said, when you start asking in my name, you're going to have full joy and you're going to receive some things you couldn't receive without my name. And then if you'll go to Luke chapter 11. And verse 11, Luke 11, 11. If a son asks bread of any of you that is a father, and we just read God is our father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks fish, Will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And then Luke 11, 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. And then one more passage to Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. And to the Lord's prayer. And these are familiar thoughts to us today. But the Lord's going to give us some deeper insight and revelation into prayer in Jesus' name. Matthew 6, 6. Take this personally. But thou, but you, when you pray, enter your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to the Father. Jesus said, ask the Father in my name, which seeth in secret. And the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. When you pray, use not vain repetition as heathen do. They think they shall be heard for their much speaking. It's not about how much you pray. It's what you pray and how you pray. Don't take long if you know what you're doing. Don't have to spend all day. We just need to know how to function God's way. Be ye not therefore like unto them your father. And please notice again, we're in the father realm of God. Knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. And these probably most famous words from your Bible, Psalms 23 in this prayer. After this manner, therefore, pray ye our Father, 
which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And then the Lord Jesus said, Amen. And when he said amen, it was a done deal. It was completed when he said amen. Father, speak to us now. Grant us wisdom and understanding from your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and we all sit together. Amen. The Spirit of God said to us, look into, explore in depth and in detail the things that I have done for you in redemption and the things I've given to you in the resurrection. Embrace them, enjoy them, experience them, and then begin to become an expression of those things to a lost, hurting, dying world. We're taking the Spirit of God and I'm following Him. And so we begin to study Romans chapter 8 and that decrees, and you read again this morning, that you are heirs of God and join heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. In simple legal terms, that means what is His belongs to you. And God, for our study's sake, has given him nine things. Number one, he's affirmed by the Father, and God affirms you today. He calls you sons and daughters. God does not talk down to his children. He builds them up. God never talks down, he talks up. God calls things that be not as though they were. Then number two, the name of Jesus is exalted and glorified, and we have full right to use his name. Full right and legal authority to use the name of Jesus. Number three, all blessing belongs to Jesus. Number four, blessing glory belongs to Jesus, and we are partakers of his glory. Then number five, honor belongs to Jesus, and we are partakers of that honor, for we are seated with him in the heavenlies in Christ. That's honor. Blessing, glory, honor, power belongs to Jesus. Revelation 5, 12. Blessing, glory, honor, power, wisdom belongs to Jesus. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ, and they belong to us. We have access to the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So it's blessing, glory, honor, power, wisdom, riches belong to Christ. The riches of the heavens and the earth belong to us because they belong to him. The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell therein. Haggai chapter 2, the gold is mine, the silver is mine. Whether that gold and silver is in heaven or in earth, it all belongs to him. The gold of heaven is divine nature, the silver is redemption's truth, and the gold and silver of the earth are the resources of the earth. It's all his. And so we have access, blessing, glory, honor, power, wisdom, riches, and then finally, strength belongs to him. He is forever. He reigns forever in a glorified body, and that strength will bring us to a place where God changes this mortality, and this mortality puts on immortality, and at the end of our journey, which will really be the beginning, we stand in him, spirit, soul, and body, glorified, forever complete, all things ours, one with him, now ready to be released into the full purpose of God, which wasn't just to have dominion in the earth, but was to take the universe and make it the place where man dwells in the fullness of all God is. We live in a universe. We don't live in a multiverse. God made all that out there for a reason. It's just when man sinned, God had to quarantine man to the planet because God doesn't want sin spread throughout the universe. The only disorder you'll find in the whole universe is here on this planet. Now just think, God made all of that for us. God made all of that for us, and it awaits us somewhere in the future. That's why Paul writes, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men and women the things God has prepared for them that love him and are called according to his purpose. And we are called, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So we are blessed today. We're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. So thank God I'm affirmed by the Father. I have a right to use the name. Blessing, glory, honor, power, wisdom, riches, strength belong to me today. I'm an heir of God, joint heir with Christ. And that comes in two full promise. Promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. First Timothy 4, 7 and 8. So it's in two full promise and we are partakers of the divine nature by these exceeding great and precious promises. Now we're studying now the second part of that thought that the name of Jesus belongs to us and it's been glorified. And so we started number one with the majesty of Jesus name today. All hail the power of Jesus name. He's exalted. 
God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things heaven, earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That name has been exalted. There's no higher place for the name of Jesus to go. It is completely exalted. It reigns in the heavens. It reigns in the earth. He's Lord of everything named in this world or the world to come. Jesus' name is forever and finally the exalted name of God. The name of Jesus. We honor the name of Jesus today. We bless the majesty of that name. Then number two, we looked at this. We're married and being married to Christ, Romans 7. We then take his name. We take his name. So his name was given through the covenant of marriage. And the traditional marriage ceremony, for better or for worse, is much better suited to you being married to Christ. Christ took you in death, that's the worst, and he gave you the better in resurrection. You see, when a man and woman are married, they're married into covenant. And that covenant means they become one and they flow as one and they agree as one. But in the covenant we have with Christ, he took all of the worse and all of the curse and gave us his blessing and favor. I'm married to Christ. Romans 7 verse 4, we're married to another, even him raised from the dead. And in that marriage, the name is conferred upon us. And then last week, we looked at maturity in the name of Jesus. And when the church understands the name of Jesus, we come together with no division. We speak the same thing. We have the same mind and same judgment. And we're brought together as one in the name of Jesus. The unity of the blood of Jesus, the unity of the name of Jesus makes us all one together in the person of Christ. You receive that? So we are then mature and we are maturing in the name of Jesus. Now this morning, you have your Bibles in John 16. I want to talk to you about ministry in the name of Jesus. Ministering in the name of Jesus. And all of us have a ministry and all of us are called a ministry. And so there are four parts to the ministry we have in the name of Jesus. There's prayer in his name, praise in his name, physical healing in his name, and then purpose, which is the great commission to go in my name and preach the gospel. So this morning I'm going to talk to you about prayer in Jesus' name, the ministry of prayer. And I thank God for prayer. I thank God for all it is. And all of us need to grow and develop a prayer life. Every one of you in this room are called to prayer. Part of your calling is the call to prayer. Part of your calling is to call to be in prayer and to pray. So I want to just talk to you out of my heart of some things that God began to deal with me about praying in Jesus' name. The first thing we see here is the covenant of prayer. You'll notice Jesus said, now you're going to ask in my name. And that is covenant. And then Jesus showed us that as sons, when we ask God, bread, fish, and egg, we do not get stone, serpent, and scorpion. And that's very significant. You don't want to pass that by. The stone is the law. It's the Ten Commandments. These things were written in stone. And the serpent always represents the curse. And the scorpion in the book of Revelation represents the sting of death. So we do not get, thank God we don't get the stone, and we don't get the scorpion, and we don't get the serpent, we are redeemed. So instead of, when we begin to pray, the three things we're looking for is first the bread. Jesus is ministered in prayer. And Jesus is that bread. So God giving us, and that's the love of God. When God's ministering to you, Jesus, he's giving you the love of his own heart. He's giving you his love. So the bread represents Jesus. So when I'm praying, I'm receiving Jesus in prayer. And then... The fish represents Jonah's story. Jonah was swallowed for his own disobedience. He was cast over into the sea. Jesus was cast into the sea. The wicked are like a troubled sea in Isaiah 57. And Jesus was cast in the sea of fallen humanity and he was swallowed by the transgression of Adam and taken to the bottom. And as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale for his disobedience, Jesus was three nights and three days in the, in the heart of the earth according to Ephesians 4 and Matthew 12 because of our disobedience. Jesus took the journey of our disobedience, not his. He had none of his own. Thank God Jesus took all my disobedience. He not only took the curse of it, but the consequence of it. He bore it all. Thank God. So I could take the journey of his obedience. So he dealt with the serpent. And the serpent lifted up on a pole. And Jesus said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he was lifted up and Jesus dealt with the serpent. And so now instead of a serpent, I get redemption from the curse of the law. Jesus was made a curse for me. Praise God. I learned that in prayer. And then the egg is the place where new life comes from. And the scorpion's the sting of death. So I will get life. So what God ministers to you in prayer is life. 
He ministers to you love. He ministers to you liberty. And it all flows out of you learning as a son to ask. I ask for Jesus. I ask for redemption from the curse. And I ask for his life to be ministered and manifested and multiplied. And that's what God's interested in. In ministering to you is both his love, his liberty, and his life. So that's the formation of your prayer life. So that's what's flowing out of your prayer life. What a covenant we have. God loves us today and he wants to give you Jesus. Jesus, your strength. Jesus, your joy. Jesus, your healing. Jesus, your peace. He's always ministering Jesus to you. In Isaiah 53, he shall be divided with the great. Jesus is divided. And every time you take that communion bread, that's a piece and a part of him. And God's always ministry, Jesus to you, not the law. He's not putting you under the dictates and demands of a stone or a law that is cold and impersonal. If you go by the old covenant, when you get to the end of it, you're always going to have a heart of stone. But if you come to the new covenant, you're going to have a heart of flesh. And that flesh sits in the heavens at the right hand of God, a glorified God man, that's where your heart is. My heart is not resting in stone. God said, I'll take the stony heart out of you and I'll put in you a heart of flesh. And my heart of flesh rests in Jesus at the right hand of God today. That's flesh and bone. And I'm bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And that's where my heart is. He's always ministering love. He's always ministering liberty from the curse of the law. So I pronounce over you, you are the redeemed of the, of the Lord. You are redeemed by blood. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. You are set free. Your chains are broken. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. And if that curse is spiritual, mental, physical, social, or financial, you are redeemed from it today. And then, thank God, the sting of death has no more place in you. The strength of the law and the strength of sin is the law and the sting of death has been removed. Oh, grave, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? You are freed today. Thank God for the grace of God that even if you leave your body, you are not going to die anymore. All you do when you leave your body is step into that next realm, that next dimension. You're free today. Death has no more power over you. Death has no more place in you, no more power over you. You're free from it. That's why you don't have to fear it anymore. If I leave my body, praise God. If I stay in my body, praise God. For me to live is Christ and to die. If you view death that way, it takes the fear out of it. If I die, I gain. I don't lose when I die. I gain when I die. Death is going to be a grand step up from where I am. And whether we go by way of translation or we go by way of grave, either way, it's still a step up. Praise God. And either way, it still ends in translation. This mortality will put on immortality. You see, when you believe in Jesus, you just can't lose. It just, you, the believer's already won. You've already won. You're winners today. More than conquerors in Christ, you're redeemed. So that's our covenant of prayer. God always ministering bread to you, not a law. Always ministering the fish to you, the message of redemption. What happened when Jesus died and suffered the curse and then the message of life, which is Jesus being raised from the dead and Him risen from the dead. He becomes your life. Jesus is your life today. Jesus is your life. He has given to you as your life and it's in Him you live and move and have your being. That's the covenant of prayer. Then look at this, there's Christ's example in Luke 11, 1. When Jesus prayed, once he finished praying, the disciples said unto him, teach us to pray. That's very important. He did not say, teach us to preach. And they said, under the greatest preacher. And they did not say, teach us to heal the sick. And they said, under the healer. And they did not say, teach us to feed the 5,000 or teach us to walk on water or teach us to cast out devils. This man said, teach us to pray because they began to realize watching him that everything he did flowed out of that place with the Father. And I've got an idea that just in the distance as Jesus separated himself and in the distance went to pray that there was a glory, there was something there that that disciple became very aware that Jesus had there that he didn't have standing here. And he said, teach us to pray. Now, I work with preachers all the time. Preachers want help to learn how to preach and how to build a church and how to visit, how to grow a church. Very few preachers have ever come to me and said, teach me to pray. But it's when you learn to pray. It's this place of prayer that where everything is birthed from and is released from so that God does it through you rather than you having to do it yourself. Now, let me shock you. Jesus preached three and a half years and everything he preached was important. But Jesus rose from the dead in Romans 8.34, Hebrews 7.25, said he ever lives to make intercession. Judge preaching against prayer. He preached for three and a half years. He's prayed for 2,000. You tell me what's more important. 
He preached for three and a half years. He's prayed for 2,000 years. He ever lives to make intercession. And thank God there's somebody praying you back on your feet today. Jesus is there in the presence of the Father. Pray, if you fall, praise God. He's praying you back on your feet. I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, not if there's a win on your life, not an if, when you are converted, you will strengthen your brother. Jesus is our example and He has prayed. And so I learned a long time ago that just study, 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 trying to perfect the art of preaching was not where the effectiveness is. The effectiveness always comes out of the intimate place with Jesus. Jesus, Lord, teach me to pray. And as I sat in my chair early this morning, I was meditating the Lord taking communion. I went back to my days. I pastored my first church, Teresa, and I pastored in Independence, Virginia. And many be the day there that I was over at the church. I'd get up at 5. I was usually at the church by about 5.30. And many the day that I was up on Independence, that little church is up on a hill, looks down over the community. Grayson County's got one stoplight in it, two banks, got two little convenience stores. I mean, it hadn't changed much since we left it in 1987. It's probably pretty much the same. It's just, it's a beautiful little place, some wonderful country people. I still got good friends there. That, that are still there, and I thank God for it. But I learned something there. Many be the morning that I watched the sunrise. And I learned how to pray Paul's prayers there. And I learned how to pray from Matthew chapter 6. And I learned how to pray out of John 17. And I learned some things there that to this day, as I, as I stood, I remember one particular morning I was standing and I had my Bible up against the ledge of the window and I was reading out of Ephesians chapter 3 and my tears were running that I would understand the depth of what was prayed in Ephesians chapter 3. And the sun was coming up and the Lord took me back and said, Now... From those days and from those moments you spent with me, you understand and you know things you prayed then are working in you now. Things that I prayed way back in 1983, 84, 85, 86, 87, things I prayed then are working in me now. I can open Ephesians chapter 3 now and I understand it a whole lot better than I did then. I cherish, I long for those times to be alone with Jesus. In the afternoons, I do my very best to be here. That's my time with Him. I try to clear everything out. I want to know how to pray. Lord, teach me to pray. And I learned something very valuable. When the Lord teaches you how to pray, He teaches you that He sets the agenda for prayer. You don't. If you want to move on in your prayer life, don't set your agenda. Let Him set the agenda. You know how I start my prayer life now? I start this way. Lord, what do you want to talk about today? What do you want to talk about? Now what's on my heart may not necessarily be what's on His heart. And I have tried to talk to God when it was very obvious he was disinterested in what I was talking about. Now, a lot of people don't understand that. They'll just keep talking even though he's not really interested and in, in dialed in. When God's dialed into you and you're dialed into him, prayer becomes a living thing. I'll give you an example. In 1991, my earthly father, we took him into the hospital. They called me. They told me from several places. All right, your dad's got about three days to live. He's, he's dying. He's 91 years old. He's got sepsis in his blood. He's got this other thing. We don't know what it is. And your, your dad, for all intents and purposes, will be dead. So I, I was on a Wednesday. I was in the room with dad. I talked to the doctor. And then a man from Atlanta, disease control, wanted to get a sample of dad's blood. They'd already sent it. And I'd already given permission for it. And they were going to let me know what that was. And I came back to the church. And I sit here and I started talking to God about my father. I said, Lord, now is this the time for my father to pass? He's 91 and a half years old. And I started pouring out. And then I, then I stirred myself up to about the healing gospel. Because I know that there's healing. No matter what age you are, there's still healing for you. And I stirred myself up. And you know, I got nowhere fast, quick, and in a hurry. That was going nowhere. And it was just like, just... It was just, it was just an ex exercise in futility. It wasn't working at all. So I stopped and the Lord said to me, now we can do this your way or my way. What do you want to do? See, my way when somebody needs healing is to come before God and just continually just bombard heaven or just keep holding before God that healing word and hold it and hold it. And a lot of that depends on my tenacity. A lot of that depends on me and my tenacity. And the Lord said to me, do you want to do this your way or my way? And so I said, let's do it your way. I'm learning. And he said, sit down, I want to talk to you. And he started talking to me about things that had nothing to do with my father. I thought it was the rudest thing I'd ever heard in my life. 
And I stopped him and I said, don't you understand my dad's in the hospital? Don't you understand this is a life-altering decision for my mother and for me and for us and for we as a family? He didn't want to talk about my dad. Didn't want to talk about any of that. He wanted to talk about stuff that at that moment I had no thought in. But if you're going to do it his way, you got to learn to flow with him. Because, I know you're going to be shocked, he knows what he's doing and how to get you where you need to be so you can bleed. Because the truth is I was doing that out of fear and frustration, not out of faith. I just didn't want my dad to die. And you can get some results that way, but the more you do that, the harder it gets to trouble the unjust judge. You can pray that way. The Lord began to talk to me about things, and after about 45 minutes, he finally began to talk to me about what he wanted me to preach that night and gave me some notes and some things I needed to say. And then about, oh, 45, 50 minutes after that, he said to me, now, uh, stand up on your feet. And he said, now, because you listen, turn around and whatever you want for your dad... Whatever you pray right now, that's what's going to happen. Now, that's what Jesus said. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. And so I stood up and I looked back towards the hospital. It was in Springs Memorial here. I looked back and I said, well, then in Jesus' name, I want my dad to live. I want him to see his 92nd birthday. I want him to live, and I want him to be past 92 when he passes, and I want him to come home, and this is on Wednesday, and I got real bold, I want him to come home by Saturday. And the Lord said to me, is that it? I said, that's it. The Lord said, say amen, and it's done. My dad came home Saturday. I wish I had a preaching church in here. My dad, 91-year-old man, giving up to die. They told me, he ain't coming out of the hospital. 91 years old, most 91s don't get healed. 91 years old, came out, and when I put him in the car, I was by myself, I put him in the car, and I said, good to be out. He said, yeah, thank the Lord, good to be out, good to be out. Got him home, he lived from that point, lived another 19 months and a few days. 92, saw 93. And didn't go back for that again. What they said he was going to die of. And all I did was turn and say, I want my father to live in Jesus' name. And I thank you that he lives and he'll be home Saturday. That's all there was to that. Now, if I had done it the other way, I would have been calling people to pray. I would have been praying night and day. I'd have had to fast three or four days and go that route. And there's a lower place you can get some results there. But if you learn to pray his way, Jesus is the example. And when Jesus prayed, he said this at Lazarus' tomb. I just thank you that you've already heard me. Now, there's some confidence. I thank you that you've heard me. Lazarus come forth and Lazarus got up from the dead. There's a way to pray that will just release great results and it's not nearly as hard as we've made it. Please understand, we've made it hard. So Christ our example and we thank God for that. Now, come with me to the Lord's Prayer and you know this well. And Jesus said when you pray, not if you pray. So you're called to pray. Every believer's called to pray. Every one of you, no one's excluded, Every one of you should have a ministry of prayer in Jesus' name. You should have a ministry of prayer in Jesus' name. Everybody in the room is called to pray. Every believer is called to pray. Would the men pray everywhere, praying always in all supplication, with thanksgiving, lifting holy hands without wrath and doubting? That's what Paul said. So Jesus said, when you pray, so I'm called to pray. So I thank God prayer is part of the building block of a successful Christian life. All decay and all decline come from the lack of intimacy with Jesus in prayer. All of it. People go back. They backslide. They grow cold. They grow indifferent. They lose a heart for church, a heart for the word, a heart for giving and serving and loving. When that intimate fellowship is not there, people lose and go back when that's not there. So Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, when thou prayest. So thank you, Lord, I answered that call today. It's not if I pray, it's when I pray. Praise God. It's not if I pray, it's when I pray. We're going to pray. So Jesus said, when you pray, when you go through the new covenant, Romans chapter 1, Paul says, praying for you always. Romans chapter 12, he says in the 12th verse, instant in prayer. Romans 15 and verse 30, strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. In Galatians chapter 4, I travail again until Christ be formed in you, my little children. In Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says to the church, since I heard of your faith and love in the Lord Jesus, I cease not to make mention of you in my prayers to 
to the Philippian saints. He said, I make mention of you with a request of joy in my prayer. And this I pray, that your love will abound yet more and more. You will grow in knowledge and in judgment. You will approve excellent things. Be sincere and without offense till the day of Jesus Christ. That you will be filled with fruits of righteousness which are by the Lord Jesus Christ. To Colossae, he says the same thing. Since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, he's not to pray for you and desire that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and wisdom and spiritual understanding. Back in Ephesians chapter 3, he bowed his knees to the God of heaven and said, I pray that God will grant you to be strengthened with might in the inward man according to the riches of his glory by his spirit in the inward man that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith that you be rooted and grounded in love may comprehend with all saints what is the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God which passes all knowledge and then he prays that you might be filled with all the fullness of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 he says in verse 9 I'm praying night and day exceeding that I may see your face and perfect that which is lacking in your faith and therefore the God the God of our Father and Lord Jesus Christ direct our path unto you and now the Lord make you this was his prayer to increase in love and abound one toward another toward all men even as we do toward you then the Lord will cause you to be established in holiness in your heart before him unblameable in love even at the coming of our Lord Jesus with his holy saints then he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter Chapter 5, this I pray, the God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God, listen to the word of the Lord, I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 in Thessalonians chapter 1, he says, Now we cease not to pray for you that God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith and power that the name of Jesus will be glorified in you and you will be glorified in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you'll find Paul, and then he, he writes so sweetly in 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, he says, brethren, pray for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, he says, you are helping by your prayer. In Philippians chapter 1, 18, 19, and 20, he says, by the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ and by your prayers, this will turn to my salvation. It's not if you pray, it's when you pray. Now, here, here's where people get in trouble. What causes God's people to pray is trouble, not truth. That's what the Lord said to me back in 2011 when I was being moved by trouble. He said, my people are moved by trouble, not the truth. And he said to me, I wish it were not so. And he said, John, when you are moved by truth and not trouble, you can deal with the trouble. When you pray because there's trouble and we've all done that and we've all been in that place where we just cried out to God because we were sinking, we've all been there. But that's not why you build a prayer life and you're never going to build a prayer life out of trouble. You build a prayer life out of truth. Can you hear that? And when none of these things move me, then I can start to move these things. So I learned to let truth govern how I pray and when I pray and whether I pray or not. And Jude said it this way, but you beloved praying in the Holy Ghost, building yourselves up in the most holy faith. And Paul said in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And then Paul said again in Philippians chapter four and verse six, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your heart and your mind through the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said in Acts chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So there's a call to prayer. I'm called. Have you answered the call? Have you answered the call? And again, I deal with preachers all the time. Preachers love the pulpit because it allows you to see the results of what I've done and where I've been. You'll know whether I've been in my Bible when I get up here. You'll know whether I've been with the Lord when I get up here. The pulpit allows for you to see things, but the prayer closet doesn't let anyone see. The prayer closet will not allow your gifting to manifest. It will not allow in there. There's no showing off in there. And I'm just telling you, this is my observation. Listen to me. In this day, we got a lot more interferers than we do intercessors. We got more fashion than we do passion in the church. And the reason is because we're lacking in the prayer closet. You got a lot of writers, but you don't have a lot of fighters that will hold there and stay there and believe there until things shift and change. Hmm. A lot, a lot of, lot of fashion. We look pretty good, but the passion comes from prayer. Vision comes from prayer. And Jesus said, when you pray, enter the closet. Now the closet, 
here is the secret room. It's the secret place of the Most High. It's not the place where you physically pray. Uh, this is not my prayer closet. I'm in here by myself all the time. This is not my prayer closet. It's a place in the realm of spirit. And the closet is the place where God's got your wardrobe hung up. He's got the garment of praise hung up for you. He's got the armor of God. Everything that He wants you to wear and put on is there. An exchange is made in the closet. And if people would understand this, prayer was not designed to change God. You can pray from now to eternity. You can't change Him because He's not going to change. And here's a deeper revelation. He don't need to change. But you, on the other hand, we got some room for improvement with you. And with me and with us. Plenty of room for improvement in my house. He don't need to change. If you ever learn this, prayer is not God changing things. Prayer is meant for God to change you. So you could come out of the closet with something in your mouth that would change things. Instead of begging God to change things, you let God change you in the secret place. And when you enter into your closet, this is paramount. Shut the door. You can't have many voices in there. You Men are complicated. They think too much. They talk too much. They have too many thoughts, too many things on their heart. When you get in the closet, shut the door. Every voice on that side of the door. Every influence on that side of the door. When I'm in this secret place, it's me and Him face to face, one on one. I'm talking to Him. He's talking to me. That's where power comes from. That's where vision comes from. Purity is made there. Change takes place effortlessly in face to face relationship in that closet. And you know what happens in the closet? You're able then to take off the garment of heaviness. And you lay it down. And then you put on the garment of praise. Now, I never even found my prayer closet to 2007. I'll never forget the night I found my prayer closet. Teresa was out of town and me and Kristen and Anthony were at the house and I'd gotten frustrated over some things and I was mainly frustrated with my son and we'd had an argument and it just got to the point where it was just there. It was where... I was just finished with that. And I came over here and I told Chris, I said, honey, I'll be back way late tonight, maybe in the morning. You'll be fine because we had the dogs there to protect her. You know, at that time, the dogs were there. You'll be fine. She said, it's okay. I'm going to pray and you may not see me until tomorrow. And then if you do see me, it's going to be brief because I'm going to the church. I made up my mind. I'm coming over here because I'd about had all I wanted to have at that point. I'd had all that I could have. You ever been there? You know, that's, that's where... <laughs> You forgive me for this, but Popeye theology, you know what Popeye's theology was? You know what Popeye said? He said, I ain't no doctor, but me knows women losing me patience. And I had lost my patience that night. I mean, my patience were gone. They were nowhere to be found. So I got some Popeye theology and I come over here and I came in and I threw my Bible up on the pulpit and I said, what is going on? Why is this so hard? It was miserable. I mean, it was, the church was struggling. I was struggling. Home was struggling. Finances were struggling. Just miserable. A mess. And it ain't no fun to try to get up and preach victory when you're in that kind of mess. It's a mess. And I came here and the Lord said, pray in the spirit. So I did. And I prayed in the spirit for about an hour and then I pressed on two hours. And I couldn't have been more bored. I had to make myself. I had to fight. I had to do everything I could do. But when I got to the end of that, right at the end of that second hour, things began to open up. And God took me into the prayer closet. And that's the first time I ever stepped in there. And I actually saw it in the realm of spirit. The garments hanging up. And the Lord began to tell me, he said, what you need, you don't need me to change Anthony. That's not even an issue. You need me to change you. You're the problem. And when I got that far, I heard God say, you're the issue here. I don't want to change Anthony. I want to change you. I want to deal with you. I don't want to change open door. I want to change you. And that night, I began to take off some things and I put on some things. And when I came out of that prayer closet, notice the father which seeth in secret. Now, here's the thing about your father. He sees whether it's in secret or not. He don't need to be open or secret. That, he sees perfect all the time. He's got 20-20 vision, whether in the dark or the light. David said it this way. If I go to the darkness, you're there. If I go to heaven you're there I go to hell you're there ain't no place I can go that you ain't already been you're there and he sees in secret but then I began to see and he showed me who Anthony was and what Anthony was and it changed my whole attitude toward him and it shifted everything and when I came out of that closet he wasn't different but I sure was different that started this journey that I'm on now. I sure was different. I had put on a garment of praise. I had a different word in my mouth. There was something different in my mouth. I had come out of my closet and Jesus said, and you just read it, the Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. And the open reward is the change that you're now walking in. It doesn't move you like it used to. It can't rock you anymore. They can't.
Let me say it to you this way. Let's take your family. And you, you all know your family. And boy, family can be it's a great blessing or they can be less than a great blessing. We'll just be kind. There can be a blessing or less than a great blessing. And you've carried your family for years and you've prayed, you've prayed, you've wept and you've cried and you've been broken hearted and you've prayed. And 20 years have gone by and I know people like this and, and they're no better. It's just as if you'd never prayed in the first place. They'd have been right where they are if you hadn't never prayed. So really what you get is the feeling you've wasted your time. You've wasted your time. When you come in this prayer closet, God will begin to show you your family from his vision. What he sees in secret. He sees things you can't see. He sees things you can't see. He'll show you. He showed me Anthony as a psalmist. He showed me Anthony as a minister. He showed me the things that belonged to my son. He showed me that. And when I came out, see, I've never viewed Anthony the same way since that night. It took about three hours to get there, but I've never seen him the same way. And I know even if I struggle with what goes on, I know that that is true because the Father seeth in secret and the reward openly is he's changed me. And thank God I prophesied my son stands as a psalmist. He's anointed of the Holy Ghost. He's here with us ministry. And that's the way it is. And I'm not moved by what he does or doesn't do. I'm moved by what I saw in the prayer closet. And when that changes you, then you put on the garment of praise. And then you're not so easily moved anymore. You're not shaken and you're not mistaken. You're not forsaken anymore. You know that the Father has saw in secret and He saw in secret. He will reward you openly. And you start living in the power of a change that comes from a prayer closet. And when you're changed, people begin to say, hmm. Hmm. Really? That don't bother you? No. Why not? And then with my father in secret. Come on. Come on. And the father would see it in secret. Here's confirmation. He will reward you openly. Amen. That prayer closet is a place in the realm of spirit. And everything God wants you to wear and all that he's designed. He's got some shoes for you to walk in. He's got some favor for you to walk in. He's got some healing for you to walk in. And you'll find it there. And an exchange is made where you could put off an old man, put on a new man, where you could take off the garment of heaviness, put on the garment of praise. You'd be amazed at what you could come out. You go in one way, you come out another. Clark Kent goes in the phone booth one way, he comes out another. He goes in one way, he comes out Superman. You go in one way, you may be driving, when you go in, you come out, you're full of living water. You may be dead when you go in, but you come out and you have resurrection life flowing in every cell of your being. You have been energized by the very breath and the life of an almighty God. You are finding something there that you're not going to find anywhere else. Ain't no preacher can give it to you. Nobody can give it to you. Jesus said, when you pray, enter your closet, shut the door, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. And don't think... That you're heard for your much speaking. The heathens do that. But your father knows. Your father knows. Your father knows. He know, He knows where you are, where you hurt, what's wrong. He knows. He already knows. Your father knoweth. You have need of all these things. It's powerful. Radical shift. Radical change. I entered my prayer closet on May the 6th, 2011. And oh, that day. That day marks history for me. I will never forget that day. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon. Bishop David Levister had been here and we'd sit and we'd, he turned that chair around. I turned that chair around. We sit and we talked for about three hours. And I said, David, I just want you to talk about Jesus. Let's just, and David began to talk about Jesus and Bishop began to speak to me about Jesus in the room filled with his glory. My tears began to run. He began to cry. And then he just stood up and he just put his hands on me and said, John, I love you and I bless you in Christ. And he slipped out and I stayed in this glory and this atmosphere and I went right over there. And that day I was able to take that horrible thing off and put on the garment of praise and peace. And, and that day the Lord whispered to me, it's been over before it started. I told you it was over. This ended before it started. It's over. And that day it lodged. That day I came out. That day I came out. Oh, I was so radically different. And six weeks and one day to the moment it time almost to the to the very moment six weeks in one day I got a phone call and the phone call from the attorney said Reverend it's over it's done I've got legal verification it's all finished 
And I just laughed and said, oh no, it was done long before then. I remember it was done for me when it started, but it was done in me that day on May the 6th. And that's what you got to have. See, that's confirmation. That's when you know that you know. That's when you possess it in heart. That's when you know it's yours. That's when it belongs to you and can't nobody take it from you. There's not a lie. There's not a circumstance. There's not a demon. Nobody can take it from you. You have received from heaven and no one can take it from you. The Father which sees in secret, He shall rewards you openly. No one can take it from you. No one can take it from you. And then we move on to the content of your prayer. It doesn't matter what you pray. It doesn't matter what you're praying. Jesus gives you, this is the most masterful lesson and we take this that he taught and when you take it up and put it over in the new covenant you'll see that it's fulfilled in the new covenant. You'll see that it works in the new covenant. But Jesus starts out and he says, when you pray, pray our Father. Now, knowing what we know, there's a living God, a Lord, a Lord God Almighty. That's out of court, in a court, most holy place. The throne room, the throne. Where Who sits on the throne? Father sits on the throne. He's talking about the Father. Highest order of God. Deepest dimension of God. This is always about a relationship with Father. Prayer is about a relationship with Father. Father wants to talk to you. Father wants to talk to you. Father wants to share His heart. One of the things I love to do is come in and say, Father, what's on your heart today? Father, where's your heartbeat? Where's your passion? Father, what's on your heart? Because the more I become concerned about His heart, the less concerned I am about what's been troubling me, bothering me. And what I find is, is that He's already moving supernaturally to meet those things that are troubling me while I'm pursuing His heart. My relationship with the Father. And then there's reverence and fear of his name. Hallowed be thy name. And oddly enough, he brings the name into it. And you know that this name has been transferred into the name of Jesus. So when you come in prayer, you're going to get a reverence and an honor for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. I ask in Jesus' name. That's not a magic phrase. That is not some lucky charm that I use. But it is really His signature on the check of all that I ask. It's His signature. His name is printed there. It's there engraven on my heart. And when I pray in that name, that brings all that He is and all that He's done into a flowing supply to me when I pray in His name. And then He said, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And His reign, you know God is sovereign. You know He's absolutely sovereign. But here's something that most people miss in this. The thing that had been done in heaven that had not been done in earth was the slain of the Lamb. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. In God's heart, the Lamb had already been slain. In God's heart, Jesus was already back. The blood was already on the mercy seat. It was already done. It was already finished. It was already accomplished. You can read your Bible and see that God unveils that and so Jesus came, and if we read Hebrews 10, He came for one reason, to do the Father's will. And that will was, Hebrews 10, 9, I come to do your will, O God, to take away the first, to establish the second. And then Hebrews 10, 10 said, By which will, being done, we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ. So when Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, Jesus brought a revelation of the kingdom. The king and his dominion. The kingdom came to earth, and then his will was done when Jesus bled, died, and suffered on the cross to take away the first man, Adam, to take away the first message, the law, to take away the first manifestation of sin, and the first ministry of the priesthood. He died to take all that away. But then, thank God, he also died to establish a second man and a second message and a second ministry and a second manifestation, which was now Jesus and the head of the body and what he's done for us and now a priesthood of believers and he established the second and the kingdom is coming. Everything that God's doing, everything he designed, everything he destined and directs is flowing out of what Jesus did on the cross. Every bit of it. The foundation flows. God's will was done. He came to do the will of the Father. And the foundation is set. And the kingdom comes. And the will is now done. And everything we're doing is flowing out of the will being done. The Lamb was slain in the earth. He's already been slain in heaven. Now the Lamb's been slain in earth. That's the foundation of the kingdom. Then notice this. The riches in full supply. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Now notice. It's not monthly bread. Not yearly bread. It's not decade bread. It's not lifetime supply. It's day 
by day by day. And this is what I love. You learn to let tomorrow go. You learn to let yesterday go. And you learn to live today. Harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. You learn today to live, to draw. And if you'll just receive this, there's a supply for you today that will cause you to live in everything God wants you to live in. There's a supply of healing. There's a supply of help and hope and anointing and power and peace. And it's in the supply of the Spirit. And it's flowing. And He daily loads us with benefits. And it comes every day. And you can appropriate it. Give me this day my daily bread and it's all in the person of Jesus for again he is the bread ministered to you in prayer and let me just say his supply is rich there's nothing lacking his supply is not enough it's too much I have to say with David my head Jesus is anointed with oil he's my head he's anointed and what happens my cup runs over because he's anointed my cup's running over today aren't you full today aren't you glad today aren't you rejoicing today celebrating the goodness of God the favor of God on your life the blessing of the Lord on your life you are the blessed and the redeemed you are regenerated you're made new you're alive you're filled you're blessed you're here and you're breathing faith Thank God my cup is running over. Hallelujah. It's running over. The riches of his daily supply. And then he speaks of reconciliation and forgiveness. Notice this. He says, watch this. He says, now, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he forgave me my debts. So I don't have any debts toward God. Why? Jesus paid my debt. We are debtors not to the flesh. And I don't even have a debt to an almighty God. You know why? Because Jesus paid my debt to God. Now either he paid it or he didn't. And if he left any of it out, I still owe. But I'm going to tell you today, there's nothing more I can do. Jesus did it all. Come on, this is a finished work church. Shout with me. Jesus did it all. He owed a debt. I owed a debt I could not pay. He came and paid a debt he did not owe. He paid it all. Jesus paid it all. So thank God my debt to God is paid. I am forgiven. I live in the constant knowledge of the supply of His forgiving, saving grace. Mercy keeps me. I'm forgiven. And because I'm forgiven, and because He has dealt with me so bountifully, then I'm able then to start forgiving those who have sinned against me. You see, He loves me. Mm, I love people. And He blesses me and I bless people. And He's merciful to me and I'm merciful to people. And He's patient with me, very patient with me. Let me go further. Very patient with me. One more time. Very patient with me. <laughs> so I could be very patient with other people. And reconciliation comes when you realize that through Jesus and through His work, you've been made right with God. And God is not imputing your sins against you. Your sins were put on the tree and put to death in Christ, and now forgiveness is given freely. You're forgiven. Now you receive that forgiveness, and you rejoice in it, and you rest in it. Thank God our sins are forgiven. I'm thankful today. My sins are forgiven. I'm right with God. But then I stop imputing sin against me. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ and I'm in Christ. Therefore, thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. And then when you get that far, you can stop imputing sins against others. When people don't do what you want, when they do do what you don't want them to do, you stop that because God doesn't treat you that way. And freely you have received, then freely give. That comes out of prayer. Reconciliation. Now, I've learned to get ahead of my forgiveness. See, my problem was, for all these years, I lived behind. See, I'm always trying to forgive somebody for what they've done. Six months ago, I'm behind. I'm six months in arrears all the time, living in debt. And the only problem with that is, especially when you're in ministry, by the time you get them dealt with six months ago, you've got three new things to deal with. And, and I always stay six months to a year behind and never did catch up because there's always new hurts. But then I learned that you can be proactive and started forgiving people. 
Before I get out of bed now, I forgive people that day. Whatever they're going to do or not do, they're forgiven. I'm reconciled to men. I thank God before I ever get out of bed. One of the things I do is lift my hands to the Father and say, Father, today I'm reconciled to you. I thank you that I'm one with you and you're not imputing my sin. Therefore, I thank you in your heart as you don't impute men their sins. Then I have that same heart towards men and I bless them. And even when men are unre and contrary, you died for them. Man, I had somebody come up from my past. I hadn't thought about him in years yesterday. I come in here to pray. And last night, somebody come up from my past. And I did, man, to be honest, you know, they're not my favorite. You got anybody ain't your favorite? They're not my favorite. If we're picking sides, they ain't going to be on my team. <laughs> I don't want them on my team. They're just not my favorite. And I thought about him and I, and I felt a snarl come out of my, I felt a snarl come up like, mm, mm, ah. And then I stopped and said, Oh, Father, thank you, thank you. Forgive me, Father, thank you. I just, I'm sorry. You know, I just, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. I know that's not the way you feel, and I don't want, I don't want to feel about him the way you, you, you don't feel about him. I want to feel the way you do. Oh, Father, let my heart be your heart. And then I said, Jesus, you died for the brother. You died for the man. I bless him. I bless him, Father, and let it go. Yeah, praise God. Even the people that ain't your favorite. Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> and then he brings you to rest and freedom through your prayer life here. Notice this. He says, lead us not into temptation. Everywhere God would lead you, you have to remember this, no matter where God leads you, the Via Della Rosa has already been dealt with. The pathway of suffering has already been dealt with. Wherever you go in the leading of God, doesn't matter where it is, the blood will always be ahead of you, never behind you. When Nebuchadnezzar said, I see four men loose walking about, three men came out, a fourth man stayed in the fire. The fourth man stayed in the fire because there'd be a day when you'd be in the fire and he's there for you. He never came out of the fire because he'd be there for you. So you learn this no matter where you go. If God leads you in the pathway of Amara and leads you into places that aren't pleasant, he took Ezekiel to the Valley of Dry Bones. Why? To get something done. Sometimes he uses his best people to do the toughest jobs. Why? Because he knows what he can do through his people. Now Ezekiel was the great preacher of his day. That would not have been my choice for a pulpit. A valley of dry bones with no ears. God got a sense of humor. Take the best preacher. Put him in a valley of dry bones. There's no ears on bones. None. None. And then he says, can these bones live... He's not being hard on Ezekiel. He's after blessing those bones. So if you find yourself in a difficult place today, he's not being difficult on you. He wants to change something, but what he needs to do is change you. So he'll give you some guidance. And then number two, he will deliver you from evil. And that word evil there in, in, in the Greek language has to do with being full of labor and toil and strife and bitterness and anger and care. Be, he'll deliver you from all that stuff so you can live carefree in Him. You can live without the care. You can live without all of that. You are free today from all that. Deliver me from the cares and the labors and the toils of life. And then His glory, you see it. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Thine is the kingdom, that's his sphere of domain. Thine is the power, that is his to rule. The glory belongs to him, and so thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory. All glory unto him. And he brings us to this place where there is now an amen. And that amen changes everything. It shifts you from content to celebration. In 1984, in Independence, in that little church, we had a precious brother. His name was Stuart. He came to me, and he had been diagnosed with a neurological condition, and he's going to have to have surgery. And you know, this is 31 years ago, so that would have been quite a bit different then than it would be now. Nobody wants to have surgery, but would have been much more frightening then because of the advances in technology. And Stuart was having dizziness and all kinds of problems. He was, he was old enough to be my father in the natural. And so we went over to the church and we knelt down. We read some scriptures 
And I anointed, and, and he, had, he was a Methodist man, started coming to my church, and he had found where that if, if the elders would anoint with oil and pray over him in the name of the Lord, the prayer of faith would save the sick. And he asked me what that meant. We, at that time, I, what I knew about it, I shared it with him. And he said, okay, you anoint me with oil, and I just pray, I, I just receive my healing. So we anointed him with oil, and all of his symptoms went away, and all of his symptoms disappeared. We ain't dismissed yet. You acting like the church is over. It's not over yet. Come on. A couple more minutes. A <laughs> couple more minutes. All of his symptoms left. And he came to church on Sunday morning, testified for about four weeks. And then on a Thursday afternoon, about oh, five weeks later, after that, so it had been about eight, eight and a half weeks, he shows up at my door, horror on his face, all his symptoms back, everything absolutely working against him. And he looks at me and he said, I thought I was healed. And I opened the door and said, come on in, Stuart. Now, this is 1984, but I knew enough to know that thinking you're healed ain't going to work. Are you listening? Thinking you're healed ain't going to work. And I said, come in. He said, all my symptoms came back. And then I said, now, I'm not, I'm not no soothsayer, but I'm going to tell you what you did. He's working on his job. All your symptoms come back. And you said out loud, I thought I was healed, but I guess I'm not. And he said, that's exactly right. I said that I'm, I'm not healed. And I said, the moment you said that, what happened? Every symptom took hold again. And I said, now, we went back to Mark 11, 24. What's everything you desire when you pray? Believe you receive them. Believe you receive them. Now, listen to it. What's everything you desire when you pray? Believe you receive them. Jesus said, believe you receive them. And you shall have them. He didn't say you'll have them and then you believe you receive them. You believe you receive them. And I said, Stuart, what you did, my brother, you gave up your faith. And he said, you're right. We prayed again, blessed him. The Lord healed him a second time and he never lost his healing. He never had the surgery. You must move to the amen. At some point when we say amen, and you go back and cross that line and still act as though and think as though and talk as though that has not changed, then that short circuits everything God wants to do in your prayer life. When you say amen, that's a big deal. Jesus said amen to this prayer. You know what he did? Amen means so be it, so be it done unto me. Done, finished, it is settled. It's a landmark in my life. This is established. And so when we lay hands on people in Jesus' name, Amen. We lock that amen in. That is the beginning of our celebration. Praise God, it's done. Praise God, it's done. Praise God, it's done. Praise God, it's done. Praise God, it's mine in heart. Praise God, the finances are mine. Praise God, the ministry is mine. Praise God, the anointing is mine. Praise God, the gift is mine. Praise God, whatever it is, you believe you receive it and you have it. And then you begin to absolutely be supernaturally changed from the inside out because it's now yours. You're not trying to get it. You're not praying as though you don't have it. You're not talking as though you don't have it. You have it because you believe you receive it. In Jesus' name. Last scripture. And here's where we begin. And here's where we end today. By Him, therefore, by Jesus, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. How often? Continually. Continually. I mean, that just ought to be going up all the time, this sacrifice of praise. Thank you, Father. I bless you, Father. Thank you, Father. The sacrifice of praise continually by Him. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. That in His name, what I have asked, I have received, I'm giving thanks. It's mine. Praise God. It's mine. It's mine. Praise God. Praise God. So what you've been asking for, believing for, it's time for you to say amen. amen. It's time for you to say amen. All right, stand for, with me now. Let's, let's exercise our faith together. It's time for you to say amen. amen. It is a faith that it might be of grace. You, you really can't access grace the way God wants you to until it's a faith. Romans 4, 16. Thank you, Father. 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 
just as sure as I'm standing here, the Lord's saying to many of you, enter your closet and shut the door. And the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, I ask you to give every person in this room a deeper prayer life. A deeper place of prayer. Lord, I pray in entering into their closet a revelation of the magnificent provision of the closet. The garments that hang there. The shoes that are there. The jewelry that you have there. The ring of sonship. The golden earrings that mark the ear to hear the Spirit of God. He that hath an ear, let him hear. It's all there in your closet. You access it through faith. Enter into the closet. And the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Shift our prayer life. Shift our prayer life. And for me, I've, I've really stopped asking God to change much of anything around me. What I want him to do is change the things in me. Uh, as some of you, if you, you really got convinced on this, if things around you change, you'd be better, you'd be fine. That, that's not true because then things would shift again and you'd be right back where you started from. God changes you. And then the prophetic word of the Lord in your mouth can change circumstances. But he wants to change you. He wants to change you. He wants to change me. So, Father, in the name of your Son, we just surrender today. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Let's go deeper. Teach me to pray. Teach me to learn how to come in here and access everything that I need to help and bless people with your heart and your hope and your healing power and your help to bless them and strengthen them in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, in closing, I speak over you as your pastor. I call you blessed today. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I call you anointed of the Holy Ghost. I call you blessed and free. I call you filled with the power and the wisdom of the Most High God. I call you blessed of your Father. I speak over your soul and I call rest and peace. The peace of God that passes understanding, keep your heart and mind through our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray your soul at rest and I hear the Spirit of God say, lay down your trouble, lay down your thought, lay down your care. Too complicated, too complicated, too complicated, says the Lord. One thought, one thought, one thought. I'm your Father, one thought. I, I'm with you, I protect you, I bless you, I keep you one thought, one thought, one thought, says the Lord. In your physical body, I speak over you healing, health, and strength today. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet to the end of your fingers, I call you the heel to the Lord. You are made whole. Peter said to Aeneas in Acts chapter 9, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. I call you whole, healed in your body. I thank you, Father, that we are healed and by your stripes we're healed and we're strengthened in Christ. Thank you that my body is quickened today. Socially, those of you that are struggling with, with issues with people, those that aren't your favorite, those that aren't your favorite, right now, Jesus died for those people that aren't your favorite. He died, he bled, he suffered for those that aren't your favorite, the ones you wouldn't choose, the ones you'd choose to do without. Those are the ones he died for. And as he has dealt with you in mercy, so now mercy floods your heart for them. And you go back to where Jesus died for them. That's where you have to go. Lord Jesus, you died. And I called that man's name last night. You died for him. You bled for him. You suffered. If he was that valuable to you, then I want that same heart in me. And don't let a word of criticism be in my mouth. Don't let a word of criticism be against that man. For me, let it not be, Lord. Put a watch on my lips and help me shut my mouth. In Jesus' name. And I thank you and I praise you and I bless you. And I thank you, Lord. And we give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. And financially, I thank you, Lord, that you increase this house. Financially, you increase the people that are here. 
I speak over you salary increase, job promotion, blessing, family. I increase favor on your finances and I speak it in Jesus' name that you're increasing. That you have wisdom to manage, to multiply your finances and favor is on your life. Favor, the grace of God is saturating your life. Now receive it in Jesus' name. And we leave here today offering continually the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. It's got to be on your lips. It's got to be in your mouth. So right now, let's do that in closing. I lift holy hands, Father, and I thank you for blessing these people. I thank you for ministering to them, increasing them, blessing them, healing them. I thank you this church is a rich well. It's a rich reservoir of your gifting, your grace, your deposit, your glory, your strength, your favor on this people. It is demonstrated to this community, and I thank you and praise you. And we give you all honor and praise, all glory and power in the name of Jesus. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Are you ready to say amen? amen? When you say amen, the celebration is yours because you have it. Praise God. I have it. Hallelujah. I've got it. Thank you. Hallelujah. All of heaven's breaking loose. It's mine. I have it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. This all